This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. I'm Cynthia Graber. Psychedelic drugs have received attention recently for their potential use as treatments for psychiatric disorders. Single high doses of LSD have shown promise for treating depressive disorders. But there's another way in which people have been using LSD, and it's what's known as microdosing, taking LSD at below noticeable levels, where it doesn't seem to have a psychedelic impact, but users say it does, in fact, have an impact on their overall sense of well-being. This is just what Harriet DeWitt, University of Chicago professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience, wanted to study. Our lab is set up to study drug effects under controlled conditions, so under double-blind conditions. So, you know, if there's a phenomenon out there and there are people making claims, then I think, okay, I want to study that. She and her colleagues published the resulting study in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. Eighteen adults took part in three sessions, one with a placebo, one with an ultra-low dose of LSD, and one with a slightly higher but still low dose of the drug. The participants didn't know what dose they were receiving, and they didn't know the category of drug they might receive. During each session, they were asked a series of questions about their subjective experience, and they also had their brains monitored using EEG. For the EEG, Dr. DeWitt partnered with James Glazer, a postdoc in psychiatry at Northwestern University. Dr. Glazer, why use EEG and how does this compare to other methods you might use to study a drug through its impact on the brain? Yeah, so a lot of things can be studied in the brain. It's really about the kind of method that you use to study them. So I, we can use neuroimaging techniques like fMRI to study kind of where things are happening. And there's some really nice research on psychedelics kind of showing how different brain regions coordinate. But what we chose to do is use EEG. So EEG is non-invasive, just records electrical activity from the scalp. And um, it doesn't know where things are happening, but it has a really good idea of when things are happening. We use this method to investigate different stages of reward processing with LSD. So how um, LSD impacts the processing of rewards over time. And so how did you answer the question, how microdose affects reward processing over time. So rewards don't begin or end with the reward itself. There are different stages, such as identifying rewards in the environment. When I got an email for this podcast, I identified that could be a rewarding experience. And then the next stage is uh, motor preparation. So preparing motor activity to pursue rewards, such as me preparing for this podcast this morning. And then um, we need to wait for uh, feedback to see if we got the reward or not. So after I finish the set, I'll see how you react, and maybe it'll be a rewarding reaction. And then at the very end, you receive feedback. In our study, uh, feedback consists of winning or losing, so just positive or negative, and it's linked to monetary outcomes. So they can win uh, money if they perform well on the trial, and they they won't lose any money, but they'll, they'll miss out on winning. So what did you find? Uh, well, first, I think it's interesting that LSD did not influence motor preparation, kind of showing that maybe at lower doses, there's not any deficiency in motor activity, which is very good when you you know are driving or doing things in the, the daily world. But in feedback, what it did do is it affected um, several components. So uh, we call them event-related potentials or ERPs, which is just the electrical signal after receiving feedback from the brain. And what we found is that uh, LSD impacted kind of the hedonic impact of feedback, the motivational impact of feedback, and also the effective impact, so the emotional impact. And we measure these over time. So first, the hedonic impact, um, we found that LSD increased the reward response very early to uh, positive versus negative feedback. It also increased the um, kind of salience of that feedback, so it was more important. And it also increased the effective impact, so it was more emotionally um, impactful to them. And what we find is that the, especially the, the low, low dose impacts this early reward component. So this hedonic impact of feedback. And that's kind of the most studied component. It's called the reward positivity. It's basically the earliest component that differentiates rewards and non-rewards in the brain that we can find. And it's been linked to all kinds of different things, such as uh, psychopathology, depression, but also um, in better mood increases the reward positivity, um, and all kinds of different drugs affect it in, in different ways. And I think it's very interesting also that depression um, typically blunts this component, so it makes it really small. And people think that this is linked to kind of the motivational and the mood deficits in depression. So experiencing things less strongly, things are less rewarding and you know less, less positive mood. And so it seems like low doses of LSD maybe might help that. 
you found the low, low dose to affect this component, but not the low dose? That sounds a little surprising in terms of a dose response. Dr. DeWitt? It's a surprising finding, and it it suggests that the relationship between the dose of this drug and the physiological effects in this case are not simply linear. So it's not just that you give more drug that you get a greater effect. And so this might have to do with the receptors that are activated. At this point, we don't know. It's it's a little bit unexpected, I would say. And what did you see in the subjective responses from the subjects? We get a lot of self-report information from the subjects. Of course, these are healthy people, so we're not asking them if they're feeling better. But we do ask them, do you feel a drug effect? Do you feel energetic? Do you feel anxious? Do you feel elated? And do you feel an LSD-like effect? And typically what we see, and in this study as well, the higher dose that we tested, the 26 microgram dose, did produce measurable significant increases in a range of measures. So they did report, on average, they reported feeling a drug effect, modest drug effect. So on a scale of 1 to 100, maybe up to 40, something like that. So the higher dose, the 26 microgram, increased feelings of elation. It also increased anxiety, also increased positive mood. So it had detectable effects. Now, surprisingly, the lower dose, the 13 microgram dose, did not produce significant subjective changes. And that's really interesting because that's where we saw the change in brain function. Could the lack of a reward signal in the brain at the slightly higher levels be because it's being affected by a higher level of anxiety by the subjective experience of the drug? It's certainly possible. And we would have to have a larger group of subjects and see maybe some people feel anxious and other people feel elated. And so maybe the brain activity is related to different subjective effects. So we would have to see that in a larger study. It's interesting to me that this low sort of sub-threshold dose changes brain function because when you think about SSRIs, people take the SSRIs for a long period of time and they don't really feel very much. They don't report a drug experience. They don't feel elated or aroused or anything like that. But somehow over time, that serotonin reuptake activity changes their psychological state in a way that they feel better over time. And so this would sort of fit with that if it holds true that a very low dose somehow changes brain function to make your world better over an extended period of time. Now, we only we haven't looked for longer than two weeks, so there's lots of unanswered questions. Speaking of SSRIs, do you think that this research could indicate that in the future, microdosing of LSD could be used as a treatment for depression? Maybe. I hope so. I will say something interesting about uh, psychedelic drugs is they affect the same sort of serotonin pathways as SSRIs, but they attach to different receptors. So you can think about it as like a fork in the road, and they get to the same conclusion by taking a different path. So the idea, especially interesting to me, is using um, maybe these low doses of LSD to perhaps in the future treat people who are um, resistant to standard treatments like SSRIs, who maybe don't respond because um, they need an alternative pathway to affect those kind of serotonin receptors. But all of that with a caveat that we're still not really sure why SSRIs do what they do. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. What are the challenges in doing this type of research and what further research does the study lead you to, Dr. DeWitt? There are challenges in doing this kind of research for many reasons. People vary a lot in their responses to LSD, both in terms of how much drug they absorb and how it moves through the system, so pharmacokinetic, and also in terms of how they respond even once the drug, presumably once it gets to the receptor. And also we're working at a threshold dose. So that means that we might see nothing and and then we don't know if we've got too low a dose. So if people differ and then if you see something, then you think, well, maybe those subjective effects are accounting for that. So it's really challenging. So I think the only way we can really approach that is to test large numbers of subjects. I think that's the only way to really address those kinds of questions. Dr. Glazer? Just a caveat on this kind of research. It can be very, very exciting, but I think people also need to proceed slowly and understand maybe not all the deep mechanisms of what's happening, but at least understand some of these interactions with other drugs and other disorders. For example, I study bipolar disorder as well, and SSRIs can actually influence um, mania and contribute to conversion to like bipolar 2 disorder. And if LSD influences these reward components in the brain, this is also evidence that these might do similar things. So I think it's also really important to proceed with caution and understand exactly who it might benefit and who it might not. 
This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. To read the study discussed in the podcast, go to www.nature.com/npp. I'm Cynthia Graber.